So um, uh, I head up the uh, research practice in Frog, um, which basically means we do a bunch of quantitative research, kind of market research, but a hell of a lot of um, design research, going out into the field and trying to figure out what makes people tick and to bring those insights back into the organization. Um, this talk is about, for me, um, something that's very dear to my heart, which is you know, we work for a lot of large organizations. They have commercial interests and they have, commercial, they have shareholders that they, uh, um, that they are um, responsible to um, in many ways. And I'm interested in the kind of ethics and the morals of what it is that I do and what it is that our team does. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. So um, a lot of the research we do when we go out into the field is about bringing um, insights that can inform and inspire the design. Um, and many of the insights that we bring in into the design studio um, are, are really the kind of building blocks of creativity for, for many of our designers in, in the projects that we do. Whether it's, sorry, these slides are a little squished, but whether it's um, uh, commuters in Tokyo or um, uh, chai sellers in India, um, we recently did a project in Afghanistan um, and actually uh, were in Egypt for a commercial client um, during the revolution as well. One of the principles of the way that we work is that we want to get into the context that people do the everyday things that they do. And so it could be anything as simple as um, capturing the behaviors of commuters um, going into Ahmedabad or trying to find conducive spaces in a community where our researchers can interact uh, with people in a way that allows us to collect meaningful data, um, but is also kind of allows us to do it on their terms rather than our terms. Um, this picture was actually taken, Jalal, taken in Jalalabad, um, where our researchers were looking at uh, um, looking for somewhere where we could interact with people in the community uh, that was conducive for this kind of interaction. This is actually in a, a barber's shop. You can't hear me clear. There we go. That's a relief. Shall I start again? No? Okay. All right. Thank you. So this is in Jalalabad. Um, and this is just one of the examples of when we're going out and about. Where can you meet people and interact with people on their own terms? And we actually spend a, a lot of time going into people's homes. And whatever the study is that we like to do, we like to start um, where people are spending most of their time, um, which is their home. And to be able to capture moments, sometimes very personal moments, and this for me is one of the huge challenges is what we do, which is when we go into people's spaces, we're affecting their behaviors but how can you get them to a point where they trust you enough? And how can you earn that trust? And what does it mean to earn their trust? Um, and then to be able to capture that key moment. This uh, photo actually was part of a study of male grooming behavior, how men present, present themselves to the world around them. And we've also done a lot of research in um, consumer uh, groups that are, some people describe it as base of the pyramid, they tend to be highly financially constrained. And if you think about how, I mean, if you think about some of the communities that you have around here, um, this is actually in Dharavi in Mumbai, uh, a family of four living in a six meter square um, single room apartment. And how can you as researchers get yourself into that space um, on their terms. Um, what is an appropriate reward for collecting data in that space? Um, and there's just so many huge um, ethical issues that we face. And, you know, we're a global agency. And every year we probably conduct 70 to 100 of these projects worldwide. Um, sometimes we have as little as four or five days to prepare. 
If we're lucky, we might get a month to prepare. And we're always traveling to these different places, and we have a very short time on the ground. And kind of one of the key questions is, how do you build up sufficient trust that you're, with the people that you're interacting with? And we, we've evolved a methodology um, which um, often revolves around uh, staying within the community. We like to stay in people's homes and renting an apartment in the community. Um, all, always hiring a local team, and we're frankly nothing uh, without our local team. And then have a, um, many different methods to kind of build trust and then bridge that trust to be able to get into the communities. One of the things I really love about working in um, resource-constrained co communities is kind of the grassroots innovation. So I don't know if you can see this photo, but could anyone tell me what this is? It's a what, sorry? It's, it's a cricket stump. This is India. Of course it's a cricket stump. Uh, it's not a cricket stump. Any other guesses? I'll give you a clue. Um, it was taken in uh, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. It, it's petrol. There we go. Who said that? Excellent. Uh, it is, actually. And it could be light bulb in a different context, right? We all know uh, that, that innovation. Um, this is a gas station. And it's not the only kind of gas station they get in Vietnam. You get the big, you get the very big gas stations, right? But as designers, and particularly designers that are traveling somewhere else, and they're, they're traveling from their own worldview, and we all have a particular worldview, I just love the purity of this. And, okay, so, so what is this? This is a bottle, and it's filled with gasoline, and it has a cap on it, to stop it evaporating. There's a kid with a pipe. I think the kid is optional. The pipe that is not optional. You need some way of getting the gasoline out. And it's on a brick. And that's a gas station. And everything you know about a gas station is wrong. Because this is the purest essence of a gas station. Now, can anyone tell me why there's a brick there? Louder. It's up for sale. It's up for sale. Uh, so you can see it driving by. It's up for sale, maybe. Um, think about if you want to get fuel from one container to another container. OK, it's height. So what is a gas station? A gas station is a container of liquid with a cap on it and a tube that sits higher than the other container that you want to transfer it to. That's a gas station. And if you look in the world around us, and you know, referencing Dugard or other uh, equivalents of that around the world, you can find these kind of grassroots, resource-constrained, designed by necessity, beautiful instances of design that frankly, as designers, we would be hard pushed to better. <clears throat> so this is uh, in the hutong of Beijing. Could anyone tell me what this is for? And I'm looking at the wheel covers. OK, here's a clue. <laughs> OK, so if you're a designer, you can look at this. And just think about the holistic experience of designing a vehicle and or owning a pair of shoes. Now, how do you feel about your shoes if someone peed on them? How do you feel about your vehicle if a dog pees on it? And as a designer, I look at this and this behavior. And this is actually relatively prevalent in China, where there's a lot of people having purchased their first vehicle. Um, and I look at this, and I see two design opportunities. And the first design opportunity is, can you design tires or wheels that encourage dogs to pee somewhere else? <laughs> okay? it's, a very, it's a very simple observation. And the second thing is, if you don't like vehicles parking in your uh, neighborhood, could you design something, uh, a spray or otherwise, that you could spray on someone else's vehicle to encourage dogs to pee on them? <laughs> and if you're very sneaky, you could actually design both. I know this is trivial, but this is a, just a wonderful example of a behavior, kind of a, a notice behavior, which we can design for. 
I'm also fascinated by this notion of how we learn, how we use stuff, and what frames kind of uh, socially correct behavior, whatever that is, and in whatever context. This is actually taken in Japan, and it's an apartment block, and these two neighbors are hanging out their mattresses, and nobody else is. And their worldview is restrained to what they see. They can't see the apartments above, and they can't see the apartments below. And I look at this, and for me, this is a reminder of how we see the world, and what it is that we see, and what it is that we don't see. Now, if you lived in Seoul, you would have a vehicle that would have one feature that I'm pretty, pretty sure that you're not going to see pretty much anywhere else in the world. And on the windscreen, there's that tiny white blob just here. And if we zoom in, it's a phone number. And in Seoul, a country with very tight roads and high car usage, where there's a strong level of social cohesion, you really do want to get on with your neighbor. Of course, only an idiot would not leave their phone number on their car because they wouldn't want to inconvenience their neighbors. And you know, this, for me, is a reminder of, and this is totally prevalent in, in South Korea. And this, for me, is a reminder of um, how kind of social norms kind of go down these little trajectories, and there's a kind of evolution that happens. We put these things out on the market, and they come together in so many different ways, revealing these kind of beautiful little nuanced behaviors. So something, one of the kind of trajectories that we're seeing for a lot of, of the clients that we're designing for is um, as more of what we're designing is inherently connected to our social networks, the option or the decision whether to opt in or out of using that technology becomes one of opting in or out of society. Um, this photo shows seven people on mobile phones and one person not in the middle of it. They're connected to other people, but they're not connected to people in their immediate proximity. Um, but it could be anything from washing machines to the music that we listen to, to our refrigerators, increasingly our cars, are all going to be socially connected uh, in ways that are much more apparent. And our decision of what technologies to adopt or what products and services to buy will be influenced by what our peers, increasingly what our peers are doing. And also our decision of whether we can discard technologies are also going to be uh, kind of inherently, one of the decisions is increasingly, are we going to be discarding our, our social network? And what does that mean? And what are the implications of that? So when many people think of surveillance or Big Brother, they think of this. They think of closed circuit TV, cameras out in, the, out in public spaces. But increasingly, the, um, uh, the things, the, the, the exhaust that we create through using everyday services, whether it's uh, mobile banking uh, or this in, in Tokyo, making payments or using ticketing using our mobile phones, are leaving that data trail for others to be able to mine. This here is a vending machine that you can find in Shibuya Station in Tokyo. And the thing about this vending machine is, and this is for, for drinks, is it checks you to see whether you're male or female. And depending on whether it perceives you as a male or female, it shows um, a particular set of drinks or not. Um, and this for me is a reminder of something that is going to mainstream massively um, in the next few years. And Seoul and Tokyo are the kind of two hotspots of this. And that is, every time you see a display, every time you see a display, it's not that you're watching it, it's that, you, uh, it's that it is able to watch you. And it will be on. And it will be observing. And what is it looking for? And what are the assumptions that it has? And how will that data be used? And this is real time. This is happening today already. Um, pretty much many of the larger stores, it will be difficult to go into a retail environment 
without the retail environment trying to figure out what you want. Amazon does a similar thing. Many, many services do a similar thing, right? Advertising or serving up products that are most suitable for you. Um, and this is increasingly bubbling out uh, up into the world out there. So the people that we formerly used to call consumers, I think there's an argument for saying um, that these people are, in many ways, becoming constituents or some other word. They're becoming sometimes active, sometimes passive consumers of technologies that they may or may not know is out there. And for me, you know, this is, again, one of the, one of the um, kind of major ethical issues when we work with very large clients who have access to a lot of this technology. So I came across this quote a while back, um, which I love. Um, and you know, we, we talk a lot about miniaturization, the ability to put cameras in everything, right? Do you remember when mobile phones were this big? This big? Okay. And... Um, Think of the cameras, think of the, all the different sensors that are out there and what they can observe. Our moral character dwindles as our instruments get smaller. And you see the guy in the middle taking the photo. You know, you fast forward a few years and every single person there will be, inverted commas, taking a photo or capturing more of the world around them, inherently. You, you're not going to see what people are doing because it's just assumed that they're doing it. And how they do that and the ethics of that, or sorry, the, the social parameters of how you should do that are changing. Um, but to go back to that quote, this actually came from a magazine called The Amateur Photographer, and it was written in 1910, when the first box brownies were introduced. And... Uh, when cameras went from being pretty large to being able to put them in, in the palm of your hand and take a photo. And that was a massive social disruption. And I'm going to talk about another social disruption, which is this, as soon as I get some water. So this photo was taken um, in Tokyo. And it's in, a, in an area where there's a lot of hostess and host bars, people who you can pay and they'll have a drink with you. Um, and actually, Japan is kind of odd. Um, a quirk of the society is that there's a lot of host bars, so women who pay men to sit with them and have a drink. And this is an advertisement for such a gentleman, and it's, it's on the street. And he doesn't have his name up there, uh, sorry, he doesn't have his phone number up there or his email address or his IM address. He has a 2D barcode here. And for me, that's a kind of in-between technology. Um, the real kind of identifier of him and his person is his face. And facial recognition, and in particular, real-time or near-time facial recognition, the ability within the boundaries of a social interaction, whether that's 10 seconds or 15 seconds or five seconds, to be able to hold something up, capture someone's face, figure out who they are, and figure out something about them, is fundamentally going to change society. And you can think about it in a work setting like this, or in a, in a, in a social setting like this. You can think about it on a campus, uh, in the supermarket, in a nightclub, um, or on a battlefield, or going into an environment where you're a stranger and people want to know who you are. Um, this, this photo was taken in Malaysia, and we were doing an interview with a loan shark, and um, my poor assistant, um, I, she was my collateral for the loan that we took out. Um, by the way, I'm hiring assistants, not that she's not around anymore, but um, uh, we, we use a lot of local assistants. So just as part of taking out a loan shark loan, he documents her. Okay, her face, her identity is collateral. And if you think about your identity, what is it that you own of yourself? And who has the power over the rights of you? How many people here are on Facebook? How many people here have a Google Plus account? 101 other different social networking accounts. 
So, you know, it, if, if you've followed it and you do Google searches, you know that if you search your name now, your Google Plus account will come up above anything else. And there's a fantastic thing, which is who owns the rights to your face as the ability to connect to people through facial recognition becomes more pre prevalent, who owns the rights to it? I mean, literally, and how will that make you feel? As researchers, um, we go into environments where um, sometimes, you know, on the, on the surface, it can be a little bit hostile or um, kind of protective of outsiders coming in, whether it's a um, very poor community or in an environment where it's relatively high risk. And um, about five years ago, when we took out our cameras, or sorry, about eight years, when we took out our cameras, we'd start documenting. And then about four or five years ago, when we took out cameras, people would start documenting us, typically with camera phones. And today, when we go in, into an environment, no matter where it is, increasingly, people are documenting us and posting it live before the interview's finished. Um, and I just love that trajectory of um, uh, how the data collection process or our, our ability to bring things into our organization, increasingly it's becoming a reciprocal process. And that's, that's quite a powerful concept uh, in what we do, and uh, particularly for the large clients that we serve. I'm going to end with this um, example. So does anyone know what this is? This is a service called 23andMe. And uh, you put some saliva in there, in the tube, you send it off, and for about 100 US, um, they'll tell you your genetic disposition to particular diseases. And they'll also, if they can, um, help you figure out who your family is or degrees of separation with other people in their database. And um, DNA testing is becoming increasingly mainstream in medical, legal, insurance um, practices. And the costs are coming down. And one of the kind of side effects of 23andMe, uh, sorry, of DNA testing, and kind of the mainstream of DNA testing, is something called parental discrepancy. And parental discrepancy is when your biological father is not your father. Okay, I think we can all figure what, out what that is. If not, someone will explain it for to you. And, you know, um, I don't know how many people are in the room today, maybe 500 people. Um, sorry to tell you this, but statistically, approximately five of you in, your in this room today, your biological father is not your father. Okay, and, and what does it mean to design services where, um, because the statistics is about 1.5%. In economically deprived areas, it can go up to about 20% with low levels of um, education. So what does it mean to design services where this becomes more apparent? So you're all familiar, I think, uh, with the um, uh, caveat emptor, um, um, uh, let the buyer beware. And just thinking about the things that I talked about today and the kind of responsibilities that come with that and designing for that, um, I'd like to propose a new way of kind of presenting, uh, of thinking about how we present um, uh, products and services to consumers. And that is uber ibe fide, which means to design with utmost faith. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you, Jan.